Hello, Ocean Enthusiasts. Now, the 1930s were a time of international turmoil in Europe, with the, the, the advent of the Second World War, in addition to a variety of diplomatic conflicts throughout the world. This was, of course, also the time of the Great Depression, and so was a period of, of difficult living by comparison to the 1920s, for example, which in several nations around the world were, were very much years of, of, uh, of luxury, and in many ways years of prosperity. However, the 1930s did still see some very major advances, most notably in motor racing and aviation, but also areas um, such as water-resistant watches developed immensely during this time. And so whilst the tradition of, of uh, chronometer rating of watches and observatory tests continued, this really was a time of flourishing for a great deal of brands and models. However, during this period there are a few models which are undiscussed and I feel had major impacts on their respective brands and on watchmaking in general. And so in this video I have four watches I'd like to speak about which do fall under the underappreciated category of watches, at least in my opinion. And four, because I feel these pieces individually describe very different elements of the industry in the period, and I think provide a very interesting narrative as to the way, uh, the way watchmaking progressed during this time. Now, speaking chronologically, the first watch to speak about is the 1932 Omega Marine. And I've spoken about this watch before, indeed, when I spoke about dive watches specifically. However, I feel it deserves a place in this video in the context of innovative and underappreciated pieces from the 1930s. Because whilst many would argue that the Blancpain 50 Fathoms, or perhaps Panerai's, were the first dive watches, or indeed some would describe the Rolex Oyster as being the first dive watch, I would view this watch as being that genesis moment. Now it's a unique watch in terms of its construction, but it was born out of a period when Rolex had released their Oyster case, and thus were able to produce water-resistant and, and dust-proof cases. And in a period of faster travel and new recreational sports, it's hardly surprising there would be new innovations to try and separate, um, separate movements and, and accurate timekeeping from their arch nemesis being moisture and dust. But the approach that Omega took with this 1932 piece, which was incidentally patented in 1931, was to have an entire external case which fitted around a square, or almost square, internal case featuring the dial, the hands, and the movement. And this formed a full seal around the crown, instead of using the crown as an external barrier to moisture and, and water ingress. Now, through production in the 1930s, these pieces came in a variety of different versions. But I'll speak about those in a moment, because they were all held under a single reference, being 679. And this was, uh, was preceded by CK for the steel versions, as is the case, in fact, throughout Omega's later history, as one sees models such as early Speedmasters being uh, the CK2915 or OJ679 for the Orjon version, or the yellow gold model, which is notoriously difficult to get hold of these days. But in terms of this piece's redesign, it was redesigned in 1935, because the clip which held the, the top of the case, which slotted over the watch itself, was, uh, was shrunken in order to be more comfortable and uh, more ergonomic. These watches did also have a movement change, because upon that change in 1935 to the new type of case, the movement changed from the calibre 19.4T1 to the 19.4T2, both 18,000 vibrations per hour manually wound movements, which were very much of their period. And these pieces did show their age to a certain degree. Most notably, these pieces featured seal skin straps, due to the fact that this was a more water-resistant form than existing other leathers, which, uh, of course, was a key important element to these timepieces. But also the seal which, uh, which, which surrounded that bottom edge of the case and allowed the top and uh, internal case to slot together was leather on some versions, and then uh, some early variants of rubber neither of which were particularly efficient, but either way this watch did become the first dive watch to be able to resist water under pressure. And of course, whilst watches previously made water resistance, such as the Rolex Oyster, were designed to resist water and dust, they were never designed to resist water under pressure. And so these watches were able to resist water perfectly fine on the surface, but couldn't be submerged to great depths. And in terms of the use of this watch, this really did show a departure, because thanks to this innovative type of case sealing, in 1936, it was sunk to 73 metres below sea level in Lake Geneva, and, and didn't show any signs of, of leakage, and was subsequently tested in 1937 in the Swiss labo Laboratory for Horology in Neuchâtel to 135 metres, again with no leaks. And so in a time when other brands were also experimenting with movable squared cases, such as, for example, the JLC Reverso in 1931, and the later release of the Cartier Tank Basculante, one does see a, a period of, of innovation in this form, However, in this respect, Omega is, is alone with this water resistance, and certainly does define their later development of the Seamaster in 1948. And so I feel this watch is a, a, an incredibly important piece in terms of the direction of, of watchmaking, but also in terms of Omega in the 1930s and 40s. If you ask the average watch lover about Universal Genève, the chances are they'll speak to you about one of two things. 
either it'll be the later 1950s style of pole router, released with the, their famous micro-rotor movement, or alternatively it'll be their Compax chronograph line. And the Compax is a line which now is highly collectible, and with pieces extending up to upwards towards £20,000 for the rarest of, of models, such as the 1960s and 70s racing versions. However, in terms of earlier pieces, these all lead back to a single start point, this being the Universal Genève Compa, released in the early 1930s as the brand's first two-pusher chronograph. And the Compa really isn't a single model, and I feel it would be foolish to designate it as being so, because in terms of this period, naming of, of watches was a highly variable point, and in fact when one looks at, uh, at other brands as well, this was a similar kind of case. And of course, by comparison to a modern range of watches which is very carefully designated and clearly marked, this does seem a bit difficult to, to get one's head round, and certainly was the case for me. But I think it does give a very interesting demonstration of the way these, uh, these different brand names, um, or model names rather, can, can move throughout this period um, and be interchanged between models which seemingly otherwise were very similar. But where the Compa itself was concerned, it was released in 1934 with a very interesting style of movement. Because in order to give it this double style of, uh, of pusher design, they had to give it two column wheels, and in fact was the first watch to ever have two in the form of a chronograph. And these column wheels didn't operate in the modern sense, when one would have, one would have for example, two column wheels for a rattrapant style of, of chronograph. Instead, these were placed on opposite sides of the movement, with one being placed in a very traditional position for a column wheel in order to control the starting, the stopping, and the resetting of the chronograph. But the other one was placed on the dial side of the movement, specifically to control the seconds. And with prices for the compacts shooting up with every year, as one sees uh, new versions uncovered and greater and greater scholarship on the models that exist, it is fair to say that compas are also increasing in price significantly. And these pieces are more rare than compaxes as a result of the fact they were only made in the 1930s and some in the early 40s, which is where we have this strange crossover between earlier and later model designations. Because this piece was given a 12-hour counter on some versions from 1935 onwards, and was renamed in some cases for, uh, for identical models in 1936 as the Compax. However, various compers were still made in the 1940s, which does show some of this, this element of variation in the period. But certainly it is fair to say that amongst collectors these are well known. However, I feel they're very under-discussed in terms of being that transition leap from Universal Genève as a, a watch brand to a brand associated with the Compax and the Chronograph thus making these watches very, very interesting, and in many ways quite ahead of their time in terms of design by the end of the 1930s. The third piece I'd like to speak about is more of a movement than a watch, because this was the Longines 13 ZN, one of the finest chronograph movements of the period, and historically speaking, one of the finest of all time. And to understand this movement and the functionality that Longines built into it, one has to understand the context of Longines' involvement in world sport and also world travel. And throughout this period, Longines were providing timing equipment for the likes of skiers and also other sports, and since 1919 they were supplying the International Aeronautical Federation with timekeeping devices. And of course their, uh, their most famous aviation piece in terms of, of popular knowledge is the model that was worn in 1927 for the transatlantic flight of Charles Lindbergh. And so in that, they really did create a, an, a, an incredibly important piece in terms of aviation, but also an intrinsically very classical one with blued hands and a silver dial. However, by the mid-1930s, chronographs were very much all the rage, and in terms of, of needs, the flyback chronograph was something which hadn't been used yet, but that in the form of the 13ZN became a highly influential model in terms of world use. But what's impressive about this movement is that it's a piece which even to the present day appears, appears extremely well specified in terms of its details and also in terms of its functions, which are, which are elements which are highly competed for by brands today in terms of their modern movements. And so to think this movement was released in 1936 and not designed for a high horology sort of background, instead was designed to be a highly functional chronograph movement, it certainly is impressive this movement um, isn't more popular than it is. And certainly the basic specifications of the chronograph movement don't sound particularly groundbreaking, since it ran at 18,000 vibrations per hour, had 17 joules and was uh, almost 30 millimeters wide, making it very sizable for a chronograph movement. However, the interesting elements come in the details, because firstly it is just such a beautiful movement to look at, with its various bridges all standing separate in the form of individual cocks, which is particularly interesting and um, certainly is something of the period, as opposed to later chronographs with much wider bridges. But from that one also sees several features which are, uh, are very different. Now first of all one has instant, uh, an instant minute counter, and so this is something which is emulated and used, in fact, um, by some of the, 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 the top brands at the moment in high horology, from, uh, from Erlang and Zerner to Patek Philippe. 
where one has a, a minute counter which jumps quickly from minute to minute, as opposed to leaving a small gap at the 12 o'clock, which could lead to inaccuracies in reading. But also this is the first flyback chronograph, and as such has some interesting elements which are different to a standard column wheel chronograph. Of course, the flyback function allows you to press the reset pusher whilst the chronograph is still in operation, to jump the seconds and indeed all the other hands back to zero and restart them instantly. And in order to do this, one has a few elements which need to be need to be adjusted. Most notably, one has to have the, the central chronograph clutch disengage and then re-engage um, in a single movement once the chronograph has been reset and is restarting. Also, there is the element of the fact that the hammer, which normally resets the chronograph, has to be able to operate whilst the chronograph is in function, and so as a result loses, loses a tooth which would normally be blocked by the column wheel, and so, so allows this to happen. But these were all at real innovations for the period, and mark this as being an incredibly influential movement for the time. And perhaps it's unsurprising that Longines were, were innovating quite so extensively in the period, because one does have to remember that Longines at the time were very much a brand competing for the very high end of, of innovation in the time. And whilst the watch market was very different to the modern age, where one has very strong high horology areas, and, uh, and a huge disparity in terms of pricing, these pieces provided really impressive innovation, but for practical applications, because of course in aviation, uh, an area where, where Longines was extremely well versed, one needed a chronograph that could be started, stopped, and then reset with a restart in one single gesture, in order to be able to, uh, to, to, to change timings quickly, and be able to time things in close succession. And it's unsurprising they were able to do this, bearing in mind that since 1913, when they released the 1333Z, they'd been a, a manufacturer of chronographs. And in fact, the 1333Z was one of the very first, and arguably the first, chronograph to be mounted to the wrist. And so with these features, and also this innovation in that period, but also simply the quality of the movement as a whole, I think it's unsurprising that Longines and the 13ZN can be remembered as some of the finest achievements as far as watchmaking go of the 1930s. And the 13ZNs are, are an impressive demonstration of this, and a demonstration of what Longines really should be, whereas nowadays, of course, it operates at a lower price range, and certainly a lower sex segment in terms of the, the innovation that goes into their watches. But certainly I think this says a lot about the brand and the industry in the period, and is certainly a very interesting piece to learn about. Now the final piece I'd like to speak about is a rather unlikely release from IWC in the 1930s. Because IWC certainly saw a period of uh, very high-end commissions, from the MOD in the late 1930s to a variety of other, other interesting pieces in that period, but I feel the model which is most misunderstood by modern buyers of, uh, of its, its modern equivalent is the Portuguesa. And this is a model which shaped IWC in the direction of, of what they're most known for in the mid-century, which was using um, fairly, uh, fairly standard but extremely well-made movements in a variety of different applications, and, uh, and indeed not really uh, advancing themselves in the conventional sense, but rather innovating to create watches which were incredibly reliable and also incredibly accurate through that period, as was seen, for example, with their Calibre 89 models for the likes of the, the, the Royal Air Force, and also with their, their MOD pieces of the 1940s. But the origins of the Portuguesa are rather interesting, because this was a piece released in, in the late 1930s, and wasn't indeed named at the time. In fact, it didn't even feature in the IWC catalogue. Because this piece was, uh, was conceived upon the request of a seller in Lisbon, who uh, requested a watch which was wearable for a man on the wrist, but had the accuracy of a marine chronometer. And so IWC said they could do this, however they would have to use a pocket watch movement. And that's exactly what they did. And the strange product of this commission was the creation of a watch which featured a 42mm case with brushed elements to its, uh, its form. And both of these elements were, were uncommon for the period, bearing in mind that people were used to polished watches with a, a size which was usually in the low 30mm. And so this, this piece really stands apart. And the first of these watches was seen to arrive in the Ukraine in 1939, not at all in Portugal in fact, and uh, in fact the earliest in Portugal arrived in 1942. And there are questions as to why this was the case, although the war is usually viewed as the, the main reason. But one sees the first generation of these watches released in 39 and running through to 1951, and 304 of these pieces were made in that time, using the calibre 74 with 19 jewels, and of course this was a manually wound calibre due to the fact that it was designed for a pocket watch. Then in 1944 one sees the second run of these pieces, which updated the calibre to the 98 with 17 jewels, and this piece in fact ran for a very long period, all the way to 1970. And the last of these watches were produced on a small commission in 1977 in Germany, where the, uh, the remaining cases of these pieces were, were fitted with new movements in the form of the Calibre 982, 
and 57 of these pieces were sold before 1957, and these often have refinished cases with more pointed lugs and fully polished finishes as a result of this refinishing. And someone sees an extremely long life to this model, although with only 690 pieces created, of which only 141 went to Portugal, this was by no means a large production, but marked a very, very interesting period in the way in which IWC sold its watches and mirrors their military pieces very, very closely. Of course, these pieces are extremely collectible these days and came in a variety of different dial variants, but I think for the period this is a very, very interesting piece and a completely unique one in terms of its story. And so I'll draw this video to a close here, but do tell me in the comments down below what you thought of my choices for this period of the 1930s, as I feel these are watches which are, whilst recognised, somewhat under-discussed in terms of their influence to their brands or their respective uh, segment of the market. And so if you enjoyed the video then do please like, share and subscribe to help the channel and also to be able to see more videos and content here in the future. So thank you very much for watching, this is Armour the Watch Guy, out.